We've mentioned in previous videos in this series that when it comes to ionic bonding and covalent bonding, we need to be a little bit more sophisticated than we were at GCSE in terms of which elements are going to form these bonds and the fact that there's kind of a spectrum of bonds in between. But when it comes to metallic bonding, it's really still quite straightforward. So we're thinking about pure samples of metals and how the particles are arranged within those. The particles in a metal form a giant metallic lattice. This is made up of regular rows of cations, or positive ions, which are formed when the atoms in the metal have lost their outer shell or valence electrons. These electrons become delocalised, which means that they're not associated with a particular atom, they're free to move and form a C. There's a strong electrostatic force of attraction, which is what we call that force when we have positive things and negative things attracted together. And that's going to act between those positive cations and the negative delocalised electrons. Those electrons are now free to move, and as they do so, they can carry charge and energy through the metal. And this is what's going to allow metals to conduct electricity. You need to be quite precise with your language when explaining this. It's important that you talk about the charge moving through the metal and not throughout, as the exam boards can be quite picky about this. We call this structure a giant metallic lattice because of the large number of particles that are involved. There isn't a specific number though. It's not like with, say, a fullerene where we might say, oh, C60 has 60 carbon atoms. It's just a very large number of metal atoms. When you're looking at that metal, you can't tell which electron has come from which atom. They've been completely delocalised, so they're no longer associated with the atom that they originally came from. Overall, the number of charges are going to be balanced. So if I have a thousand sodium atoms that have lost a thousand electrons, I'm also going to have a thousand plus one ions. And if I have 10,000 magnesium atoms, each with a two plus charge, I'm going to have 20,000 negative electrons to balance that out. Now at GCSE we described how this bond formed, and it's exactly the same at A level, but at A level we now need to be able to talk about the strength of that bond. And essentially the higher the charge density, the stronger the bond will be between those positive cations and those negative delocalised electrons. So we need to know what the charge on the ion will be, which is of course intrinsically linked to the number of delocalised electrons. If a magnesium atom is going to make a 2 plus ion, then it's going to lose 2 electrons. And it's also going to depend on the size of the ion. Don't forget that as you go down a group, the charge of the ions will be the same, but those atoms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that same amount of positive charge is going to be sort of spread out over a bigger area. So if we take sodium and magnesium as an example, these are both elements in period three, which means that they have the same number of shells. Now, you might think that that would mean that the ions were the same size, but actually the magnesium ion is going to be ever so slightly smaller. Magnesium has 12 protons compared to sodium's 11, and that increased nuclear charge is going to mean that the outer shell electrons are pulled in ever so slightly closer, and so a magnesium ion has a smaller radius than a sodium ion. Also, that magnesium ion has a 2 plus charge, because magnesium is in group 2, so it loses 2 electrons to form an ion, compared to sodium, which is in group 1 and only loses 1 electron per atom, and therefore produces ions with a single positive charge. Now, because the magnesium has a higher charge on each ion, it also has more delocalised electrons. And therefore, there's going to be a stronger bond between the cation in magnesium and those delocalised electrons. So you would expect magnesium to have a higher melting point, which it does, and also to be harder, which it is. You've probably seen sodium being cut with a scalpel before, but if you tried that with magnesium, you just wouldn't get very far. So we could think about this in terms of an exam question. Like, why is magnesium harder than sodium? For A-level chemistry, you always want to be really specific about where the electrons are. So not just saying, oh, this atom has an electron in a higher energy orbital, but actually giving numbers and giving um, subshells. So magnesium has two electrons in its 3s subshell. That's its final subshell where its valence electrons are. Because it's got two electrons in its 3s subshell, there are going to be two delocalised electrons per atom shared in this lattice. Magnesium also has one more proton per atom compared to sodium because it has 12 rather than 11. And that's also going to mean a stronger attraction between that positive ion and the electrons that have been delocalised. The magnesium atom is actually going to be a little bit smaller because, as we've said, that positive charge in the middle, that stronger nuclear charge, is going to pull the electrons in ever so slightly closer. So the atomic radius of magnesium will be smaller too. Overall, we're going to have stronger bonding, and because there's stronger bonding, there's a higher melting point and a higher boiling point.
and overall that's just going to make the magnesium harder. If we look at lithium and potassium, we can see something similar. These are both group 1 elements, so they both form ions with a single positive charge. But potassium is a much bigger atom, it has two additional shells. And so if you think of this in terms of surface area, well it's just going to have a bigger surface area for that positive charge to be spread out over. So if you could look at a picometer squared of the atom, then you would find that each little square of potassium would have less positive charge than the lithium atom would, because it's just been spread further. And that means that when it comes to attracting electrons, each little bit of the potassium atom is less attractive than the equivalent sized bit of the lithium atom. So therefore, the electrostatic force between potassium ions and the electrons will be weaker than that between lithium ions and the electrons. And that's why potassium is softer and also why it has a lower melting point. You can melt potassium at about 60 degrees C, whereas lithium is more like 180. So here are some other properties of transition metals. The metals that are in that central D block with incomplete D subshells. They have high melting points, they're good conductors of heat and electricity, they're hard, they're malleable, they're ductile and they're lustrous or shiny. As we've just explained, the metallic bonds between the positive metal ions and the delocalised electrons are very strong. And that means that high temperatures are needed to overcome the electrostatic attraction. And that explains why they have high melting points. The delocalised electrons are able to move freely through, not throughout, the giant metallic lattice. And that allows them to carry charge and energy and therefore conduct electricity and heat. The word malleable means that a metal can be hammered and pressed into a shape whereas ductile means it can be shaped into wires. Both of these are a result of the lattice structure of a metal. As we said at the start, the positive ions are arranged in really regular rows, and those regular rows are able to just slide over each other, and it's possible to do that without breaking the metallic bonds. This explains why it's possible to hit a metal in one place and just have those particles move along the top of the next layer. This also explains why alloys are so much harder than pure metals. In an alloy, you've got atoms that are a different size because they come from a different element, and they're going to distort those regular rows and stop them from sliding over each other. Finally, let's have a little look at some exam style questions. You might want to pause the video at this point and write down what you think the answers are, and then you can check whether you've got them right or not. Firstly, we're asked to state the block of the periodic table containing iron. So the block, remember, is going to be named according to where the outer shell electrons of this element are. And of course, they're in a d orbital, so iron is in the d block. Iron has a high melting point because it contains positive ions and a sea of delocalized electrons. And between those, there is a strong electrostatic force of attraction, and that requires a lot of energy to overcome it. Remember, you always want to be talking in terms of the amount of energy required to overcome the force, not just saying it's easy or it's hard. The bonding in iron is obviously metallic because it's a metal and when we draw this we want to draw the positive ions and draw the delocalized electrons and hopefully add some labels and you always want to make sure that you're adding enough particles. Don't just draw one or two, usually they'll specify six or eight but it's not going to take you very long to draw a little grid like this so just make sure that you have enough particles in there. Here are two final questions to check your understanding before we finish. Again, you may find it helpful to pause the video and write down what you think the right answer is and then check to see whether you got it correct. So in the first part of the question, we're asked to explain why it is that lithium has a higher melting point than potassium. These are both group 1 elements, so they're both going to form ions with a single positive charge. So this isn't about the charge on the ions, it's about the size of them. Lithium, being in period 2, is obviously a smaller ion and therefore it has a higher charge density. Linked to that, the delocalised electrons in lithium are closer to the nucleus because there are fewer shells, and they're also going to experience less shielding as a result. Overall, the electrostatic force of attraction between the lithium cations and the delocalised electrons is going to be stronger. In the second part of the question, I'm asked to both state and then explain which out of calcium and potassium has the higher melting point. And now I've got calcium in group 2 and potassium in group 1. Firstly, I need to say that potassium has a lower melting point than calcium. The first reason for this is because calcium has more protons. It has a higher nuclear charge. 
That's going to mean that actually the ionic radius of calcium is ever so slightly smaller. Because even though calcium and potassium have the same number of shells, that last shell in calcium is going to be pulled ever so, ever so slightly closer to the nucleus because the nucleus has an extra proton to attract it in. Therefore, there's going to be a stronger attraction between the ions and the delocalized electrons in calcium. We can also talk about the fact that there's going to be more electrons in calcium which are going to be part of that bond.